Katrina. Angels or dragons? Time to use your senses again. Trina, motherfucker, so you better listen to me. Yes. No, come here, please. Please, come here. like a big bird listen clearly like a big bird we're gonna get some more of this man we're gonna get some more of this but love to trailer park girl miss della rose <laughs> you know you got a camera at your trailer park 
and making it happen. Remember, the fox is the serpent. We're just talking dragons and angels, right? So when you hear serpent or the deceiver, the deceiver doesn't look like a dragon or a snake in your indigenous mind. Ahab, Aqua, Tai, Bell. I mean, she's been dropping drop. Man, I mean, I think Ty Battle's probably always been drop and drop. The ultimate wave server. This book is called The Greater Exodus, and, you know, you can get those parts. We, we dropped on it, but remember... You talk the Americas, you're talking Peru, you're talking Mexico. All these nations knew of a great flood and an ark built for preserving men and animals. There were similar accounts of the creation. The inhabitants of Mexico spoke of a man who with his wife was saved in a boat. of a bird which flew from his hand and came back again to him. With a green branch in its beak. De La Borde found in South America an account of the creation. Light was in existence before the sun was created. Right, the Most High says, let there be light before the fourth day, right? where the sun was created and the moon. So even according to your indigenous writings, light was in existence before the sun was created and a woman was formed out of the rib of a sleeping man. Barleas found among the North American Indians an account of the fall of man through disobedience Quote, in the loss of paradise and the events connected with it, the fox plays the part ascribed to the serpent in the Hebrew legend. I need you to meditate on this because we're talking dragons and angels. So don't come and serpent us and talk about our talk about dragons when... Only, you know, when it came to the Bible as it is written today, did the dragon that you think of or the serpent that you think of, you know, get demonized. Before that, in your correct mind, as an indigenous North American Indian or an indigenous, indigenous Amaru Khan, when you thought about a serpent the way they describe it today as a deceiver, you're talking about the jackal. You're talking about the tempter, right? You're talking about the fox, right? Who plays the part ascribed to the serpent in the Hebrew legend. You dig it up. You do the recon. You look into the connectivity of what they're giving you now in the Bible and with Christianity. Now making the dragon bad. Oh, the dragon's a serpent. Nah, not if you're talking a tempter. Not if you're talking the jackal. Oh, we're going to get deep into it, man. This is part one of the series, man. Angels and dragons. And we're going to talk jackal. We're going to talk Hebrew roots and verbs and you know, we're going to get down on these, on this Hebrew so we can understand, overstand, and understand the Tanim and the Tanin. T-A-N-N-I-N versus the T-A-N-N-I-M. Small difference, right? 
big difference. Because when you talk jackal, you're talking tempter. When you talk Fox, right? You got Fox News, right? So who's the deceiver? You have Fox News, right? Who's the deceiver? Who's the dog-headed man? Who's the Cephalus? Phallus, Cephalus, Anubis, Egypt, Phallus, Cephalus. Cephalus. <laughs> Syphilis dog. Well, we know syphilis is the syphilis. This is the disease that they were giving indigenous people. Oh, there we go. Cephalus. You know, we gotta figure this English thing out. This is a phallus. So you gotta be trying to hide this, man. Dog headed. <laughs> there we go. So they try to hide it, right? You see, they're trying to hide it, right? We're talking angels and dragons, and who's the real Satan, man? Who's the real tempter and deceiver? They call it Sinocephalus, right? Now they uh, have a disease called what? Syphilis? How did that come into being? When you research it, it has something to do with this dog gene. And people with dog heads like who? Anubis, right? Notice he's a brother, right? With a dog head like the sign of Cephalus, right? Remember, according to the indigenous Naga, in your right mind. So you're not thrown off when we're talking dragons. We're not talking the true serpent or the tempter or the Satan who is who. The fox plays the part ascribed to the serpent in the Hebrew legend. In the Egyptian legend, the jackal is the tempter. And you know this Christianity is connected to Egypt, right? You got you know, the Immaculate Concep Conception Jesus, right? And then you have Horus. Horus as an Immaculate Conception Sun God, Sun God, the Sun, the Sun, go through the Sun, worship the Sun. That has everything to do with the Cephalus. Oh man, I mean, when these dog headed people came over here, boy, you call them Christopher Columbus.
Some others might call him Saint Christopher, the dog-headed man. Oh yeah, saints who never were, Christopher dog-headed. You call him Columbus, right? Some might call him St. Christopher the dog-headed man. We're just talking sinusophilus, sinusophilus. The phallus, right? Egypt, right? Anubis, right? The jackal god, right? The jackal is the tempter, man. The fox is the serpent, man. Not the dragon that only became in Christianity. So when we talk dragon, we talk fire, water, air, and earth. You're talking the combination. You're talking the crystallization. You're not talking about the serpent. Do dragons call themselves serpents? So you're not talking about the serpent. Because the serpent is the sign of Cephalus, the serpent is the jackal, the serpent is the fox. And was St. Christopher really a dog-headed man? He's holding the cross, boss. Alright, you know, I just want to establish some things as we dig on these angels and dragons, man. Welcome back to the class, man. We're just talking St. Christopher, the dog-headed man. Look at this, man. Look at this, man. Is this play-play? That's St. Christopher. This is Anubis. This is Sinocephalus. The fox plays the part ascribed to the serpent in the Hebrew legend. Come on, man. It's called Christopher, dog-headed, man. Dog-headed Christopher, venerated to both the Russian and Greek branches of the church. They venerated St. Christopher. Columbus Day, right? Look at this. This is a sculpture, man. You think they would waste the time putting a dog head on this man if he didn't have a dog head? This is sign of syphilis. Syphilis. Man, you recon syphilis dog gene and see where syphilis comes from. The tempter, right? Thoth, the tempter. The dog-headed Columbus. Look at all this dog-headed Columbusness. Meditate on this because I think this plays a big role. A big part in what's going on, man. I think this plays a big part about what's really going on, man. Why does St. Christopher have a dog head? The Christian saint was seven foot tall with a dog head. Meditate on this, man. Because it looked like he came with the dog head and without the dog head. You gotta dodge the hijack. You gotta dodge the hijack. I mean, you tell me. You tell me it's a play play. Is it play play? 
Is it play play? You like to make these pictures real small so you can barely see them, right? You see it with the halo behind his head. Like Jesus. The dog is a man's best friend, huh? Is it play play? These are murals, man. I mean, these are high level paintings, man. Oh, dog headed monkeys. Yeah, man, we're talking sinus of violence. The fox plays the part ascribed to the serpent in Hebrew legend. So your dragons are not the real serpents. This is. Meditate on it. Meditate on it. Meditate on it, man. Is it play play? I mean, you know the truth. <laughs> you already know the truth, man. Well, we're taking our time with this series, man. We got a lot to cover. Before we just go and start digging back on Seraphim and, and all this tannin, tannin, tan, jackal, you're gonna understand why there's such a similarity when you deal with the tannin and the tannin, and why one refers to a jackal and one refers to a dragon. It's a frequency war, people. Dogs versus dragon. You know, some say, oh man, you know, <laughs> you know, certain whites have this uh, smell of sulfur if they get wet or their hair gets wet or, you know, different things. And there's this connection with this dog, man. Remember in Matthew, was it Matthew 15? In the New Test. I mean, if we're going to get new testy, let's get new testy like this. Twenty-two, and behold, a Canaanite or a Canaan woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him saying have mercy upon me O Lord thou son of David right my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil but he answered her not a word and his disciples came and besought him saying send her away for she cried after us but he answered and said I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel so this was the purpose <laughs> this was the purpose of this character here, right? He said, hey, man, look, man, I only came for Israel. And I say character because they created a character from the real Joshua who was literally showed you with his action <laughs> that he only came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I mean, Joshua brought you to your promised land. We're going to talk Kitsukotu. We're going to talk Kukukan. 
only sent for the house of the lost sheep of Israel, the Nagas, the Amarokah. But Christians today say, ah, yeah, 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 but you know, God is, uh, you know, the whole world. And he just told you I only came for Israel. Yeah, I know, but the whole world, you know, we're all God's children. He just told you, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's it. You want to make it clear? Then she came and worshipped him saying, Lord, help me. But he said in answer, it is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. Now, you know, these Canaanites was doing a lot of high vibration slicing and dicing and splicing they had a lot of things among them man look at these pale looking legs and this dog head oh man it is not meat what it is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs and she said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Sinus Cephalus, Anubis, the tempter. In the Egyptian legend, the jackal is the tempter. That's the serpent. The jackal is the tempter. Oh, the Nubis got all the power, man. The Nubis got all the power, man. So, yeah, you know. Dogs, man. You thought they was just playing? It is not me to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. Yeah, but the dogs do eat the crumbs which fall for the master's table, man. Come on, man. Give us something... Give us something, man. Give us something, man. Come on, man. Give us something. Let's go. I just wanted to get an uh, overstanding of Sinus Cephalus. The dog-headed people. Venerated dogs. Oh, give us some crumbs from the master's table. Please give us some blessing. So now we know who the real serpent is. Now we know who the real tempter is. In the loss of paradise and the events connected with it, the fox plays the part ascribed to the serpent in the Hebrew legend. In the Egyptian legend, the jackal is the tempter. We're talking the indigenous mind, man, not the invader, not the Christian. So as we dig on angels and dragons, let everyone talk they shit, but you're digging on the indigenous mind. You're digging on the grounding, on the orientation, and you know what a serpent is. You know what a jackal is, and that's the original tempter. Read about the Tuskegee Airmen. And the Tuskegee experiment, excuse me, you know what I mean, when they gave these brothers in Tuskegee syphilis. In 1932, the Public Health Service, working with the Tuskegee Institute, began a study to record the natural history of syphilis in hopes of justifying treatment programs for blacks. It was called the Tuskegee Study of Untreated Syphilis and Negro Male. It involved 600 black men. Do you think they signed up to get syphilis? 399 with syphilis, 201 who did not have the disease the study was conducted without the benefit of patients informed consent 
without the benefit of their consent. So they didn't know. They didn't know they were getting syphilis. They didn't know they were getting syphilis. This is from the CDC.gov website. The panel found that the men had agreed freely to examine and be treated. However, there was no evidence that researchers had informed them of the study and its real purpose. In fact, the men had been misled and had not been given all the facts required to prevent and to provide informed consent. The men were never given adequate treatment for the disease, so they just gave them syphilis and sought, just waited to see what happened. And when penicillin became the drug of choice for syphilis in 1947, researchers did not offer it to the subjects. The advisory panel found nothing to show that subjects were even given the choice of quitting the study, even when this new, highly effective treatment became widely used. So they gave these brothers syphilis. This is the Tuskegee study, right? Come on, man. On who? On you. They're just giving these people syphilis. Syphilis. All right. Let's go. Now, when you talk Dragon, right? We're going to talk Dragon in the script. You're going to need to know what a tan is. And what a tanine is. And tanime is. So when they want to refer to a jackal. Or a fox. Or a cephalus. Or an Anubis. Right? Jackal, fox, serpent. It is the uh, eight. Eight five six five. It is the tan. You got the Brown Drivers Briggs breakdown. The Jackal, and they try to confuse it and compare it with the Dragon. But let's go. Let's see what makes sense. So the plural form of tanim is tanim with an M. Tanim with an M. Now they say it gets confused with this dragon or whale. And that's a big, big, you know, part that we're going to study the difference. Because you see here it says taninim, tanim with an N. The difference is that tanin is a singular form. This is not plural. This is the singular form. If you want to say the plural form is tanin. So this is why you, you know, see how they're trying to trick you, right? When they want to talk serpent. You say, well, which are you referring to? You know, your version or our version? Because when you want to talk dragon, then this would be the singular form, right? Tanin. Not tan, right? They say tan. This is a singular form. Then you want to confuse it with tanin. Compare tanin, which is the dragon. Or what they call monster, sea serpent, marine animal. And they say also a jackal or other hideous land animal. Let's get some clarity. Tanin is a singular form. 
noun, masculine. Definition, serpent or dragon. A tan is a jackal. H565. H577. Let's get it from here. So what if we put in tan neem with an M? Plural of tan, fountain of jackals, right? And they say, okay, well, a pool near Jerusalem, dragon well. But now you have a plural form of tan, which is, first they give you jackals, right? So why would you need a differentiation between tanim with an M? <laughs> With that little, that little M, would you switch it to an N? What do you have? Oh, there's a whole breakdown for it with an N going directly to the dragon. So when you talk Tanim with an M, you're talking the plural of Tan, which, you know, first to give you some dragon drop, right? But then they give you back to the jackal. I'll let you know there's a difference. Because we're just talking tag. Now why is this important? Let's go. Let's get back in the lexicon. Let's talk Moses and the serpent, right? Let's talk Numbers 21. Let's go. Numbers 21 and 9. Let's read it and go back. Wow. We just keeping the water flowing, man. Matter of fact, do we got our water? Where's our water, man? Let's get some water, man, because we just talking the sea, right? We're just talking the dragon. We're just talking the water. Get some water flowing for the tribe. And much Ahab to the dragon sponsors on the wall. Keeping us flowing in the ether. Keeping our water flowing in the ether. Let me give some special Ahab, man, to my brother Simon Johnson. My brother Robert Brown. Kind of fresh with it, dude. 
I'm gonna get some AI man to Here we go. To Veranda Rosado, man, my sister Renana Israel. AI to my brother Hibai Okunye Meju. My sister Patricia King. Aha, my sister Marcia, aha, my sister Monique Hamley, aha, my brother Jose Hikis Yosef the Real, aha, Penelope Campbell, aha, Niles Dodd, aha, my sister Miss Dean the Cop of Color Awakening, aha, Raymond Zulietta, aha, Nettie Perry, Hey, hi, man. Those are our dragon sponsors on the wall. And hey, hi to my brother Calvin Niles, man, for the wonderful donation, man. We are surfing the wave. And I got a few great family on Instagram, man, that keeps dropping great drop. I want to make sure I give them some hey, hi, man. My brother Just Alawood. Hey, hi, man. My, my brother uh, Zion Fortress, man. Hey, hi, my brother. My brother Hebrew State of Being, hey ha. My brother Israel OVO, hey ha. My brother Talus, Talos see everything, hey ha, man. Oh man, that's just a few, man. My sister Kenya, hey ha. Malik Yada Zadat, hey ha, man. That's just a few, man. You know what I mean? That's been dropping that drop. I appreciate y'all, man. And uh, let's keep the water flowing. Let's go. We're just talking jackals, we're talking serpents. And we got our water flowing. And yeah, we flowing in the drop chatter, man. Hey, hi, my brother. Dawi. Hold up, man. Aki. Dawi. What it do? Get some hey, hi to my brother Dawi, man. We just talking numbers, man. Let's go. And when the king of Arid, the Canaanite, remember, don't uh, don't deny us our blessing, Jesus. Even the dogs eat the crumbs, right? Remember the Canaanite woman. Let's go. Which dwelt in the south. Heard tell that Israel came by the way of the spies. Then he fought against Israel, and he took some of them prisoners. And Israel vowed a vow unto Hawah and said, If thou wilt indeed deliver his people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And Hawah hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities and called the name of the place Hormah. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake to Hawah against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loath this like bread. And Hawah sent fiery serpents, right? Among the people. So right here. Are you talking jackal? Right? Are you talking fox? Or are you talking dragon? Right? Are you talking tanine? Dragon? Or are you talking tan? Jackal? Are you talking uh, snakes on fire? Are you talking fire breathing dragon? And if Hawa is sending fire breathing dragons, then clearly they are in his control, right? This is a part of his, uh, you know, uh, battle formation, you know what I mean? And they bit the people, all right? We're going to get to this bit, this bite, because either it's literally biting or the fire is biting the people. Let's go. And much people of Israel died. 
So you determined that the Most High sent snakes on fire that bit the people. Snakes that fell start slithering around, biting people, right? Or did the Most High send fire-breathing dragons and the fire bit the people? They got bit by the flame, right? Verse 7, therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, we have spoken against Hawa and against you. Pray unto Hawa that he take away the serpents from us. Please take these dragons out of our midst, man. Because they're biting us, man. They're burning us up. And Hawa and, and Moses prayed for the people. And Hawa said unto Moses, Make you a fiery serpent. Again, did he make a snake on fire? Uh, a brass bronze snake uh, statue thing? I mean, how is it fiery if it's a statue? So for all those that say, oh, well, Moses must have made a uh, some type of statue of a snake, man. See, he made an idol, man. Or did he literally make a fire-breathing dragon? And was it truly a bronze or brass? Right? See the translations? Brass. We're going to get on this brass, man. Look, man. We, we, we need to have a 360-degree panorama perspective of this numbers 21. You're talking angels and dragons, man. So Moses, make you a fiery serpent, right? Snake on fire or dragon. And set it upon a pole. So did he make a, a statue, put it on a pole? Or did he make a dragon and tell it, sit here on this pole, man? And the dragon sat on the pole. All right, let's go. And it should come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he look upon it, shall live. So when you go look at this dragon, if he bites you or if he breathes fire on you, you will what? Die or live? Live or die? Oh, you live. So right here you see that the Most High can curse you with the dragon or bless you with the dragon. You know what I'm saying? You got Satan, right? Who can curse you or you can be blessed by the angels, right? You can be blessed by the, you know, high level etheric, you know what I'm saying? Angelic dragons. Now, if Satan is an angel and most Christians would say, yeah, that's a bad angel. But then you say, well, does that make all angels bad? Because Satan's an angel. Are all angels bad because Satan's an angel? So all dragons, if you say Satan's the dragon, he's the dragon, that's a demon. Are all dragons bad because Satan's a dragon? Are all angels bad because Satan's an angel? So adjust your perspective. Because if you get bit by the flame, you will live. He said, Moses, make you a dragon. Put it on this pole. He said, dragon, chill over there on that pole, man. Whoever you breathe on is going to live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. So this dragon gave you life, huh? First it was firing up on your ass, but now it gave you life, huh? Well, let's talk about it further. Let's talk about this brass scenario. Numbers 21 and 9, right? Let's look at it. Let's let's look at different versions because I think we have a uh, you know some uh translation difficulties. I think we're lost in translation, man.
So pretty much everyone, right? All these translations. You know, they're all agreeing. Okay, cool. Make it a bronze snake. But let's 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 look deeper at this bronze and this brass. So Moses, this is out the lexicon, right? Make a bronze or copper, huh? Uh-oh, boss. So you telling me that the word they're translating as bronze is really copper? Something made of that metal coin? You saying that's the H5178? So first they try to give you the bronze and the brasses and the bronze and the brasses. First, they give you all these bronzes and brasses, man. Oh, back up. Uh oh. Fine copper. So, when you start having this copper being interchanged. Right, Ezra 827, bronze, brass, copper, copper, copper. We're getting to the root of things, right? We're getting to the root that the Most High told Moses not just to make a dragon, man, but to make a copper dragon. So why do they say bronze, right? Because they want to make it sound like a statue, a brass statue. And you're going to have to dig on it. What if this is just a copper dragon? Let's keep running. Let's keep running. Pull up this link. You got all the links, man. Let's go. Moses brazen serpent as it relates to the serpent worship in Mesoamerica. Because remember... When we talk serpent and the loss of paradise and events connected with it, the fox plays the part ascribed to the serpent in the Hebrew legend. If you're talking North American Indians, man. That's why there's a difference between a tanine and a tanim, a, a jackal. Or we're going to talk the seraphim, the highest order of the angels. We're going to talk that. Angels and dragons, seraphim, dragon, the flying serpent or dragon of Moshe. You got all these links, man. We're going to get into it, man, throughout this series. This is an old, you know what I'm saying, painting, man, from, I believe, the 1500s. And yeah, this is from Persia, so they Persianized these images, but this is supposed to be Moses and his dragon. Then they had some of Moses and Aaron conjuring up a dragon. It's literally called Moses and the dragon. This is out this, you see all this Persian writing, right? It's supposed to be Moses and Aaron conjuring up their dragon right, dies to hijack so we're going to get into the dragon in Eden a nakash in the garden a snake or a dragon right but first let's go we're talking numbers 21 right did Moses make a a snake a bronze brass snake or a copper dragon? 
And let's connect this with Kitsuko Oto. And before we do that, let's remember just like the fox playing the role of a serpent in the indigenous mind. Let's get back in the indigenous mind with the Papu Va, which is the sacred book of the Quiche or the root people. So if you want to talk Kitsukoto, you might want to come home first and not get an invader's perspective of what the Kitsu and Kooto is. Go, let 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 go. Oh man, this is a great breakdown. It breaks down the cliche writing. You'll learn a lot. You'll learn a whole lot digging on that. We just want to know about this dragon business, right? We want to know about the angel business, right? You want to know about the framer and the shaper, right? You want to know about the framer and the shaper, right? You want to know about the serpent, right? You want to know about the framer and the shaper. We'll pause it. Read it. Read it for yourself. Let go. Here we go. I got you. Let's take our time and, and get it right because we're talking serpent, right? Or is this a translation that we're just talking dragon? Or are we talking fox? Are we talking coyote? I mean, these are all the questions you have to bring up in the investigation. Read it. So you have the indigenous powers, right? The indigenous powers, man. Remember, the framer and the shaper, right? Sovereign and Kitsukoto or Kitsu Serpent. So Framer is your mother. That's wisdom. She is framing. She is putting the ingredients together. That is wisdom. Remember Proverbs 8. Wisdom of Solomon 8. Wisdom has her laws, which are your father's laws. You keep those laws, you get granted your mother. Wisdom, Solomon is praying to Hawa, he's praying to our creator for his mama wisdom to fortify his kingdom this is your framer this is your shaper your father is your shaper he molds you he shapes you, you're shaped in the vibration the seed, right you can also say the framer is sovereign and the shaper is the Kitzel dragon and then you also have these indigenous names here, Shimukana and Shipayako. Without their titles, the six names appear together, planning the creation on page 68. And again, in connection with the creation of humankind. Later in the account, yet another god, Heart of the Sky, will be named as the presiding deity who oversees the work. Now, Framer, also titled Sako, Sako, refers to one who makes something by putting things together. Putting things together. What does wisdom do for you? 
Does it help you put it all together? What does mama do for you? Building from stone or adobe, a meal from various ingredients, or a woven cloth from individual threads. Put it together. The shaper refers to one who makes something by modeling, modeling, molding. Pottery from clay. I created you. I molded you out of clay. I modeled you. You're in my vibe. You're in my vibration. Or a sculpture from carved stone, thus giving shape to an otherwise amorphous substance. So that's Zako and Bieto. The framer and the shaper. The framer and the shaper. That is your Ha and that is your Wa in the Hebrew, the fifth and sixth letter. The Ha is your mother. That's the revelation. That's the revealing. That's the breath. That's you putting things together. Wa is the frame, the foundation, the shaper. This is your foundation. This is your security. Together, it's a breath of security. When you put that together, you're in the right vibration. So you have the framer and the shaper. The most frequently, look, man, most frequently mentioned gods involved in the creation of the world and its inhabitants. If you're looking at it from the indigenous mind, remember, according to the indigenous mind, the fox plays the part ascribed to the serpent in the Hebrew legend, according to the North American Indian. The Egyptian legend, the jackal is the tempter. The most frequently mentioned powers involved in the creation of the world and its inhabitants are the framer and the shaper. Their names imply that the creation involved giving frame and shape to matter that already existed. Right? You cannot destroy energy. Let's go. Rather than conjuring something out of nothing, this pair of gods, these powers, right? Elohim, right? Plural. Pair. Powers. Was so important that soon after the Spanish conquest, listen up. Father Domenico de Vicio used their quiche names to refer to the gods, the power of what? Oh, the Old Testament man. The Torah, Tanakh. Meditate on this as we go further, man, because when we talk framer and shaper, and when you talk kitsu, koto, You talk Joshua, you talk the creator, the Kitzel is already a title, this lofty bird that lives in the cloud forest, this lofty bird that lives in the highest etheric areas, the highest cloud forest or the highest forest, that's what a Kitzel is, see man, you, you gotta get the drop, so you know the difference between a Cephalus Oh, that's Votan. Yeah, we're going to get that drop. <laughs> Cephalus and a dragon. So, you know, when we talk Kitsu, bird, cloud forest, Kitzels fly high in Mon Monte Verde cloud forest. The Kitzels, you know, I say, oh, these demons. No, these aren't foxes. These aren't jackals. These these aren't the tempters. The Kitzel is in Costa Rica, man. Love to Caramayo, the most famous Kitzels. Fly high, fly high. Most people come all over the world to see the resplendent Kitzel. Look at this bird. Look at the colors, right? Remember the rainbow covenant. So when you talk Kitsukoto, you're talking a rainbow dragon who 
flies in the sky and forms its bow, its rainbow, right? Which is a sign of the mark, the cross, the covenant, the monument, the sign, the towel, the cross, Kitzel, Joshua, promised land, wore a robe filled with crosses. Oh man, love to Paku, remember this drop, Book of the Beginnings, by Gerald Massey, who's also talking Kitsukoto, Eshu and Anhar in Egyptian mythology, and Moses and Joshua conducted their people with the solar orb around the circle of signs, overcoming the opposing powers postulated by early man, so in the Toltec, right, which we know are Israelites, Mythology, Hawa Mak, and Kitsukoto conducted their people through the pilgrimage and wanderings recorded in the picture writings. Hawa Mak, like Moses, wrote the code, the code, the code of laws. So you got Hawa Mak, which she's saying is Moses, and Kitsukoto, who is who? So Hawamak, like Moses, wrote the code of laws for the nation and conducted the civil government. Kitsukoto, in relation to Hawamak, or Moses, plays the, plays the part of Joshua. So it's not me going crazy and us going crazy when we compare these things. These are books that have been written. And we've searched it out and found the correlating, corresponding evidence in antiquity, substantiating resources, talking the same thing. Kitsukoto is Joshua. When Joshua began to give the laws instead of Hawamak, he sent a cry to the top of the mountain of Alkari, whose voice could be heard for 300 miles around. Joshua follows Moses as the leader of Israel and instructs the people to go up against Jericho, his mountain of outcry, and to sell it with the shout that ought to have been heard at an equal distance. And it was so loud, it was loud enough to make the walls fall flat. The old red land, Hoa Hoa, the H U E is H U A, Hoa La Palan, was the name of the original home in the north from where the Toltec migrated. So they were coming from Hawa Hawa. Their leader, Kitsukoto, wore a long robe marked with crosses. The sign identifies him as one who crosses the Tau, right? The Hebrew Tau. Kitsukoto attained the land of promise, and his golden rain and air of wheat grew so large that one man could hardly carry it. Joshua let the people into the land flowing with milk and honey, where a single bunch of grapes was a load for two men, or pomegranates, right? Pomegranata. So, we're talking about this Hebrew connection right here in America, which is what we've been digging on. Kids of Koto. We're going to talk about how the Mormons call him Jesus Christ. Right here. This is their Jesus. We say, no, this is Joshua. He's leading his people to the promised land. And you're making phantoms and duplicates in your New Testament regarding this Joshua who wore a robe filled with crosses and led his people to the promised land. Kids are called to attain the land of promise. We're just talking to Kitzel Bird, right? Much loved in Central America and is actually the national bird of Guatemala. We keep hearing about the connection, the Hebrew connection with Guatemala. And they even named their monetary unit the Quetzal. We're just talking about the Papu Va, right? Quetzal, serpent or dragon. So you have this lofty rainbow dragon. Quetzal, serpent, rainbow dragon. Let's go.
So this pair of guys, this power, this framer and shaper was so important that soon after the Spanish conquest, Father Domenico de Vizio, de Vizio used their quiche names to refer to the God of the Old Testament. So the God of the New Testament and the God of the Old Testament must, must be different because he just made a differentiation between the God of the Old Testament. He singled out the God of the Old Testament. What does that tell you? This is not, you know what I'm saying, us trying to blow up the spot. This is a Spanish monk, friar, missionary, Father Domenico de Vicio, who came over here and studied the power of the real world, the old world, right? And found the Old Testament God. This pair, this ha, this wa. This framer, this shaper. Let's go. And this is how it begins. He who has begotten sons, as they are called with Hanupu Possum and Hanapu Coyote. Great White Picari and Koolti or Koolto, right? Sovereign and Kitsu Serpent or Rainbow, Kitsu, 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 the Kitsus, right? The Kitsu birds. Sovereign and Kitsu Serpent, heart of the lake, heart of the sea, mother and father, right? Creator of the green earth and creator of the blue sky, right? Mother and father, right? Mother earth. Doesn't the most I say, I beat it out. I beat out the expanse of the sky in Isaiah. I beat it out. I rock wa, rock wa. I literally beat out. I met it out the heavens. I stretched it out like a tent. I stretched out the sky, Shamaim. I, I stretched it out like a tent. You're talking mother and father, man. More accurate translation for Alam, however, is she who bore children. From the perfect aspect of the root verb, al, A-L, to bear children. Al means to bear children. It is a feminine. Al, all. Alam and Kajalam, or mother and father, or framer and shaper, or he who begets sons, as they are called, along with Hanuku Possum. Hanapu Coyote, Great White Picari, Coyote, Koti, Sovereign, Kitsil Serpent or Dragon, Heart of Lake, Heart of Sea, Creator of the Green Earth, and Creator of the Blue Sky. And this when we talk sign of Safali, we're not saying every dog ever created is some demon, right? Just just because, you know what I mean, <laughs> you got this frequency. That's been grafted into it. We're not saying every fox and every, uh, you know, dog, you know, whatever. I mean, we're just saying, sign of Cephalus, man. You look it up. You dig on it. You got to dig on this. So we know when we're talking Papu Va, you know, we can have our water flowing. When we talk Framer and Shaper or Ha. And our wa. These collectively are e evoked and given expression as midwife and patriarch, whose name is Shi Pia Piyokak and Shi Munkane, something like that, the protector. The protector and the shelterer, right? Shelterer, right? Shelterer, right? Protector and shelterer. So wisdom tells you in Proverbs 8 that I'm fortifying, right? I'm protecting. I am your protection. I am fortifying the kingdom, fortifying, protecting. And then with your father, he is the shelterer, right? That's the wall. That's the foundation. That's the security, right? We're just talking the Quetzal, right? 
the rainbow dragon, right? Right, you have your Aleph, your Bat, let's go to the Paleo, your Gom, your Doll, right? You got the strong power, right? The Ox Head, right? Going into your house, your tent, then there's movement, there's a foot, there's a gathering, there's walking after the strong power enters your house, there's movement. Then you go through a doorway, right? You have a purpose. You go through an entrance. We're just talking Paleo Hebrew here. The fifth letter is, they say a man with arms raised. No, that's your mama. That's the framer. That's the protector. That's the midwife, right? Let's go. So this is your breath, this is your revealing. And then you have your father who's the WA, W-A-W, we're not making this up. This is Pictopaleo, WA. If you got something against the WA, you have something against your security. Secure, secure, secure. Or shelter. So you have your protector, all right, creator of the green earth. Creator of the blue sky, as they are called, or protector and shelterer. And the shelter correlates to the security. The protector correlates to the revelation itself, the breath to put it all together, the wisdom, the fortitude of wisdom. So you have the fortitude of wisdom or protection. Your kingdom is fortified and it's secure. So you have this breath of security, this fortifying security, which is your ha, wa, w, a, w, a. Then you get your rest. Then you get your zan or zion. Then you get your cut off day, your seventh day, right? Your nourishment, your food, your weapon is your zan. But first you get your framer and your shaper, your ha and your wa. And this is Pictopelio. So we're not making it up. We're coming directly hijack free out of Pictopelio when we say Hawa. We talk our revelation, our breath of security. We're talking framer and shaper. Remember how important this is. Father Domenico de Vicio used their quiche names to refer to the God of the Old Testament, which is the true creator of all things. This pair, this power, this divine couple, this framer and shaper, this Hawa, is the God of the Old Testament. Your mother is wisdom or Shekinah. We're just talking Kitsu, right? So let's go. Remember, Moses made this, uh, this copper, copper dragon let's see how they break it down here in this document out of BYU Brigham Young University we're talking about Moses's brazen serpent or copper dragon let's go and that's related to how the Christians try to tie it into serpent worship but remember that's the Christians because according to you native North American Indian the fox is the serpent. The fox plays the role, the part ascribed to the serpent. The fox plays the part ascribed to the serpent, man. So don't get lost in the sauce when you're talking St. Christopher. Let's go.
We're just talking Moses, man. Let's make sure we still have our water flowing, man. Cause, you know, we're just talking the high, and we're just talking the wide. And I like to have that wow flowing at all times. Activate. Wow. Wow. Let go. <laughs> love to my love to my dog date da woo da we. I have a dragon, man. He's just dropping mad drop in here, man. So get in that drop chat. Password is one, two, three, four to get through the door. <laughs> I got you, Dawi. I got you, man. Let's go. Moses is brazen serpent. Has relates to serpent worship. Let's get it. This paper shows the account of Moses brazen serpent as taught by the Nephite leaders. We're gonna dig in. We're gonna start digging on the Mormons. Let's go, cause you know they got some drop. Presents parallels to the symbol and the name of the Mesoamerican god Quetzalcoatl, or who they're venerating. Right. It further shows that the term "flying" used in the Nephite, but not in the biblical account of the fiery serpent. So they're going to tie in the fact that the Nephites are not hiding the fact that these are flying fiery serpents. Because then it gives it all away. Then we know we're talking dragons once they're serpents on fire or breathing fire. And they're flying. But now we know we're dealing with a flying, breathing, fire, breathing dragon. Tanin, right? Tanin in the Hebrew, when you're talking dragon, you're talking Tanin. And where are we talking Tanin? We're talking Tanin in Genesis 1 21. The great sea monsters. Right, the great sea monsters, right? The creation of these great sea monsters, or they like to call them whales, right? When you got P.T. Barnum in the museum burning down with Phineas, man, free Phineas, the last great American dragon. In the press, you know, in, in the uh, article, it says that four whales were burned alive. Four whales is code word for sea monsters or dragons. And this is when you have Phineas coming out of this, you know, freak show museum from P.T. Barnum in the 1800s. Let's go. Exodus 79. <laughs> Like this. Exodus seven and nine. When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, then you shall say to Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, 
and it shall become a serpent. Whoa. Whoa. Because we're about to start digging, man. We're just getting started. <laughs> we're just getting started in this series. We're just setting it up, man. Let's go. Let's go. Let's get it for the dismount, man. We're about to get it, man. Let's go. So, when we talk this serpent that was created by Moses, right? And the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle, take the rod, and it's going to become a serpent or a dragon, right? Because we're just talking Tanim. And when we talk Tanim, you're talking Exodus 7 and 9. When we talk Tanim, you're talking dragon. So now that we know this, we can do it appropriately, right? So Moses, take the rod. And it shall become a dragon, right? That's why you got this artwork. Even if you got to dodge the hijack images, you got this artwork of Aaron and Moses conjuring up this dragon that's devouring the priest of Egypt. Because the rod turned into a dragon that devoured the priest, not just the snake. It devoured the priest of Egypt. That's what this drop is about. It's supposed to be Moses here and his dragon from his rod. Wow. wow. Come on, man. Remember the towel. The two cross sticks is the mark and the sign. Keep this in mind. And Moses said unto Aaron, and Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as Hawai had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Wait a minute, is this Tanin? Exodus 7 and 9. Talking Exodus 7 and 10, right? Exodus 7 and 10, right? Exodus 7 and 10. Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh. It became a serpent. So it became a dragon. All right. Moses' rod became a dragon. Let's just get clear. This is just clarity. This is just clarity. Now that we're just talking what? Tanin. Not tan. Tan is the jackal. The plural form of tan is tanim with an M. And they try to tie that back into serpent or dragon because they want to hide the dog-headed man they want to hide the real tempter they want to hide the real tempter fox plays the role the part ascribed to the serpent the fox is the serpent the jackal is the tempter we're just talking cephalus so let's go now that we got some clarity on tan and tanim we know we're talking dragon with this rod and with the Mormons they put the flying fiery serpent so you know we're talking the fly flying fire breathing dragon we got Kitzel we know we're talking about a lofty lofty high flying right like the Kitzel bird is a high flying right the Kitzels are flying high this is Named after this high-flying rainbow dragon, which is the rainbow covenant. The rainbow in the sky, your covenant. Let's go. So archaeologists and scholars agree that there are countless document in in instances of serpent worship, right? So... Dodge the hijack because you know that that these angels, right? 
are not worshipped. They're worshipped by, you know what I'm saying, folks that have fallen. All right? But, you know, you know the what they're trying to say is that these are angelic entities in various forms throughout human history. Yet despite the innumerable varieties of serpent worship only in Mesopotamia, do we find a preponderance of feathered serpent worship, right? The feathered serpent, right? Carrasco, because we're just talking to Kitzel, right? The feathered, right? Let's go. Carrasco emphatically, emphatically states that there's no doubt that serpent symbolism, and more specifically, feathered serpent symbolism, is spread throughout the architecture of ceremonial centers in Mesoamerica. The god who was represented by statues and pictorial representations of feathered serpents, also known as Kitsu, Koltu. So they're confusing the god, right, with what we're getting in the Papu Va, which is the what? God of the Old Testament. Which is the what? The Kitsu, right? The dragon. Or is this, you know, a function of the creator of the green earth and creator of the blue sky? The who? The framer and the shaper. The ha and the wa. All of the ancient peoples of Mesoamerica worship many different gods. The beauty of an indigenous bird so captured their interest that they not only borrowed its name, but used its form as well to represent their principal and most revered god, the Kitsukotu. The what? The beauty of an indigenous bird. Are you seeing clearly? Separate substantiating evidence. That we're just talking this beautiful high flying bird this high etheric angelic frequency bright colored various shades so we're talking this bird in the highlands of the chiapas mexico and guatemala the quetzal is a strikingly beautiful creature with a three foot long iridescent green tail, crimson breast, and a myriad of other bright colors on its coat. However, through all the maze, this maze, we find that the Mesoamericans consistently endow kids oh, 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 I got you, I got you, I got you. Got a little excited. Got a little excited. There you go. I got you. <laughs> so, the Mesoamericans constantly endow Kitsu. Kotu with many Christ-like attributes. Christ-like, like what, Gerald Massey? All right. Their leader, Kitsukotu, wore a long robe marked with crosses. Crosses, right? Like the cross, right? Like the last letter, the tau, the cross sticks, right? The St. Andrew's cross, right? The tau. A mark, a sign, a signal, a monument, the towel, right? The cross. Kids of Koto, Mark wore a robe filled with towels. St. Andrew's, Roos, towels, cross, two cross sticks. Kids of Koto attained the land of promise. We're talking Christ or Joshua. Let's go. It's a code of the creator of life, taught virtue, was the greatest Lord of all. Now you see why these Mormons are tying it in, right? Because they have to. And let's talk about this serpent thing. All 
Right, right. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord, against thee, praying to the Lord. They take away these dragons, right, these serpents. Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said unto Moses, Make a fiery serpent. Set it upon a pole, right? So you got that. Whoever, you know, it bites is going to get life, right? They're going to live. But why did God use the word fiery in his command? Make you a fiery serpent. Although most biblical scholars concede that the serpents in this area were very colorful, even of a glowing, fiery red color, there is a disagreement among them as to whether the original Hebrew word for fiery referred to the snake's color or its bite. Fiery bite? Hmm. Uh-oh. This paper suggests that it referred to both. Although it would be Presumptuous to speculate on the Lord's actual reason for using the word fiery, we can assume he wanted the serpent to be bold, bright, colorful in order to draw attention to the powerful symbol. Although the Lord did not specify which material to use, Moses constructed the serpent of brass, even though, or copper, right? Even though it would have been easier and faster to use cloth or wood if you're talking about some, something fake. Brass may also have seemed to be the best choice for portraying a fiery aspect. One could imagine the dramatic impact the gleaming brass serpent had on suffering Israelites as Moses carried it aloft high above his head, the serpent flashing a myriad of pierce, piercing fiery colors such as the sun shone upon the numerous angels and crevices. Such a spectacle would surely serve to remind the people to remind the people of the fiery intensity of their snake bites <laughs> while simultaneously displaying God's omnipotence since as they looked at it they were healed so what's the real what's the truth interestingly the brazen serpent was kept by the Israelites for some 500 years wait a minute let's get some drop out of this because we know we're talking to dragon not 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 some fake thing not some fake colorful thing right we already dug on that. We already dug on the tanim of it all, right? So we know we're talking to the dragon of it all when we're dealing with Exodus 7, all right? And Numbers 21. You know, you can go all the way down and see all the time that this tanim is used. All these occurrences. Let's go. 500 years during the time the sacred symbol was devalued into an object of popular worship in Judah. So we're not just talking about the fox. We're talking about the dragon. And they say it was a sacred symbol. Does this mean that they were worshiping the dragon? Or that they overstood the angelic energy of the creator? Now, of course, some started hijacking this whole situation and worshiping idols of dragons. But that's not the original overstanding when you dealt with our framer and our shaper. Let's get it from here. We're going to dig on this Book of Mormon. Let's take it from right here first. First Nephi 17. This is note Nephi's use of the word flying in the description of the serpent. 
And he did straighten them in the wilderness with his rod, for they hardened their hearts, even as you have. And the Lord straightened them because of their iniquity. He sent fiery flying serpents among them. Snakes on fire, or are we talking dragons again? And after they were bitten, he prepared a way that they might be healed. And the labor which they had to perform was to look and simply... And because of the simpleness of the way, or the easiness of it, there were many who perished. In contrast to the Old Testament, the Book of Mormon clearly defines the Lord's lesson, which Makanki states was to typify Christ, okay, and point attention to salvation, which would come because he would be lifted up on the cross. All right, man, see how the Mormons are hijacking the situation of these fiery flying serpents. It now becomes imperative to explore why the biblical account refers only to fiery serpents, whereas the Book of Mormon refers to fiery flying serpents. For the one use of the word flying is important in understanding what took place in Mesoamerica. Uh-oh, let's bring it home. If Joseph Smith had personally authored the Book of Mormon, instead of merely translating it, he would have been foolish to interject the term flying into the description of Moses' serpent. Since the term flying is not used in biblical account of this event, this term does, however, appear later in the Old Testament. In two of the prophecies unrelated to the brazen serpent, Isaiah uses the phrase fiery flying serpent. In Isaiah 14, 29 and 30, verse 6. And in the Book of Mormon, in 2 Nephi 24, since Nephi describes the serpent as not only fiery, but also flying, we can theorize the Bible originally depicted a fiery flying serpent. Bang, bang. Dig on it. But somewhere along the way, the term flying was changed or omitted as various scribes and editors translated the retranslation of the Bible over the centuries. The usage of the term flying in association with Moses brazen serpent is indirectly supported by numerous works of the modern scholars so we're just talking about the wings and what they've been hiding in translations man and you can dig on this uh great doc here man it's just tying in the book of, you know the book of mormon moshe kids of Kodal, it all seems to be tying together We're talking about the Kitsu. Since the Kitsu bird was revered, was rep was revered for its magnificent color, beauty, and elusiveness, it inspired awe and reverence and was capable of invoking the image of a fiery flying serpent, huh? Oh man, look man. Love to the blackdragon.com. We're just talking kids so cold too, right? The Aztec great father serpent or dragon god, right? Or angel, right? Or energy. Koku Khan was the name used by the Mayans for this creature. As one of the most popular gods, this creature appeared in many forms and art as well. As entails, not only this, but he was the only God that did not require human sacrifices. He was the only God that did not require human sacrifices. Of course, when they're saying God, they're referring to you, your prophets, your Mashiachs as gods. So what you need to know is this Kitsukot or this Joshua did not require human sacrifices. He was the only one. Let's go. In addition to the popularity, he seems to have been a god of many things, a creator god, god of twins, the god of evening and morning star, protector of craftsmen, rainmaker, firebringer, teacher of the fine arts. All right. The Kitsukota was opposed to regular human sacrifices so much that when the god of war Tezcatlipoca appeared and asked for sacrifices. The Kitsukotu tried to dissuade others from agreeing to it. He failed, however, and decided to leave. Where did he go? 
When will he return? How and where Kitsukoto left has been a bit of a mystery. There are different variations of this tale. In one version, it is said that he proceeded to the Gulf of Mexico and there burned his body. Or <laughs> went into dragon form. Another, which he was reborn as the planet Venus. Alright, Dr. Hijack. The more common ending is different. It has been suggested that the Spanish used this ending to aid in their conquering, conquering of the Aztecs. It is said that Kitsukoto promised his most loyal that he would return. Why are they calling him Jesus? Oh, Jesus is coming back. Well, according to the indigenous people, they're saying that Kitsukoto promised his most loyal that he would return. Does that sound familiar? If we're just talking Joshua, remember, Kitsukoto wore a robe marked with crosses. This sign, this mark, this sign, this towel, these cross texts, this mark, this mark, this sign. This sign identifies him as the one who crosses. Is he going to return? Kitsukoto to attain the land of promise. Is it going to return? We're just talking Joshua. He will return. All right. All right. All right. Occasionally, <laughs> the Kitsukoto would shape shift to become a man. So we're talking the rainbow, the Kitsu, right? We're talking Joshua, right? And now you're finding in another substantiating source that Kitsukoto will return. Because the Mormons are talking Jesus, right? This creature was Amphitur, meaning the creature only had two wings and no, limb, no other limbs. Also, the creature possessed multicolored scales and feathers. Multicolored scales and feathers we're talking the rainbow covenant right the mark the sign the mark this sign this sign the cross sticks this sign let's go multicolor scales and feathers right feather dragon occasionally the kids of culture would shapeshift to become a man this man this joshua so Joshua literally can become a dragon, rainbow covenant. Let's go. We're just talking the flying, the kitsu, man. This this beautiful bird, this flying, flying, fiery dragon. Hey. Since feathers are the source of a bird's ability to fly, and since birds are, in fact, distinguished from other creatures when flying, the feathered or kitsu portion of the name could have easily and naturally emanated originally from the word flying as used by the Nephi and fi fi flying fiery serpents, man. You dig on it, man. We're just talking Moshe, right? The Kitsu itself could be seen to appear as this fiery flying serpent. So, what's their conclusion, man? Naming their god after the venerable Kitsu bird was certainly a natural and instinctive choice for the Mesoamericans, the indigenous, further, since they also used the word Koolto or serpent or dragon. So, the Kitsu is this rainbow, lofty bird in the cloud forest. The Koltu literally means dragon man. Their vision of their deity must have embodied attributes symbolized both by the vividly colored flying bird and by the dragons. Could it be that this embodiment was actually rooted in the version of Nephi's fiery flying serpent and was corrupted over time? We're just talking about the dragons. So when we get this Koltu and this Kitsu, and we're in the Papal Vu, talking to Framer and Shaper, 
for the Kitsu Dragon, the Sovereign, Wisdom, Creator of the Green Earth, Creator of the Blue Sky. And we're overstanding that Kitsukoto is said to return as well. And he's rainbow colored, right? Multicolored scales and feathers. Shape shifting to a man. <laughs> Shape shifted to a man, huh? Well, that's 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 just great. That's just great, man. Because when we talk seraph, we're talking angel, right? Seraph is an angel of the highest order. When we talk dragon. You're talking fiery shooting meteor, right? To Coom say, right? A fierce, violent person, male or female, as this man or woman is a dragon. This man or woman is a dragon. Occasionally, the Kitzel would shapeshift to become a man. This man or woman is a dragon. This meteor, this priest, right? Because Quetzal was a priest king. Who is Prester John? A meteor. A meteor. A shooting meteor, right? To Kumse or imaginary serpent, right? Or rainbow covenant. Shapeshift to become a man. Let's make our dismount like this, man. Cause we just getting stuck. Oh, my back, my back. Getting, I'm getting excited again. Got very excited for the dismount again, man. My back. Let's go. I got you. I got you. I got you. I just got excited about the dismount. Quickly. It's a great form right here. You can dig on. For the past year, I've been thinking about this. What do angels do? They watch over humans in God's society. What do Eastern dragons do? They watch over humans in God's society. So he's comparing angels and dragons, right? We got some of this before. From uh, Shadow Tiger. Or he's saying this is from uh, Draconic Chronicler. Right. In more modern times, various Christian denominations have rewritten the Bible vainly, attempting to wipe out all traces of the heavenly dragons because, says, but it is a hopeless task because they could not rewrite the original scripture in Hebrew plus new archaeological discoveries, including whole books of scripture which the Catholics tried to destroy, add only more evidence of the dragons which curiously appear in virtually every other world culture as well. And rarely as a symbol of evil, but rather as power and wisdom. Wisdom. Just as the ancient Hebrew and Christian scriptures also originally portray them. It is pointless to argue whether or not God and his, angel, and his angels and dragons are real. But my book proves, as the original scriptures themselves, that both the Early Christians and Jews understood the dragons were a kind of heavenly serpent creatures to God. Heavenly serpent, huh? Pull up all these links, man. We'll dig more on this. We're talking seraphim. We're talking the dragons of the highest order. Fiery serpents, right? Majestic beings with six wings, right? Human hands, voices, in attendance with Hawa. Snakes or dragons, man. These serpents with wings and feet. I'm pretty sure this qualifies them as dragons, man. I'm aware that the immediate reaction of most conservative Christians don't have the same reaction as conservative Christians now. Remember, when you talk serpent, the fox plays the role to the serpent. So you're just really talking... Cephalus, the dog headed, right? The dog headed, right? So that's not you. Let's go. We're talking dragon. It got nothing to do with the dog headed serpents, man. The, the tempters.
the Hebrew word seraph is used seven times in the Holy Scriptures or Hebrew Scriptures. All right, you got Numbers 21, Deuteronomy 8, Isaiah 14 and 30. Twice there. Every time except in Isaiah, it is translated fiery serpent or something very close to that. In Isaiah 6, it is simply left untranslated. Seraphim is just the plural of serif or seraph. Right, what's a seraph again? Seraph is what? An angel of the highest order. Got it. Let's go. The Nephilim in Genesis 6.